Hello, welcome to AA Beyond Belief. I'm John S., and this is episode 67. Hello, I'm back with Ben, and uh, we're going to be talking about another movie today, uh, Smashed. And uh, Ben, uh, I'm going to kind of let you take the lead on this, since you, you know, you have the expertise in um, talking about movies and knowing about movies, and maybe we can talk about um, our reaction to the film, how it relates to our recovery, and maybe just have a conversation spin off from there. Yeah, sounds great, Sean. Um, expertise, I'm not so sure about that, <laughs> but I, I certainly do love films. Um, when I was a counselor, I, I used them in treatment quite a bit. Oh. Um, I, I think it was pretty cathartic for, for some of the groups I would do. It would be, um, you know, sometimes when you're a counselor, one of the other counselors who's supposed to be running a group gets behind on paperwork, and so you have to cover for someone. So sometimes I would have two hours to, to run a group, and we would we would watch a film and process it together. And I, I felt like it was a really powerful tool. It's um, sometimes treatment and all this AA stuff is so formal and, and the dogma in AA, it almost takes like the heart out of things sometimes. And, and films have a way of just like cutting through all that and touching you in a way that you can't even, you don't even have time to think about or process. It hits you and, and it's just, you can't help but react a certain way. Yeah, that's true. You know, um, I, I, when I watch this movie and almost any time I watch a movie that's um, related to recovery, um, I, I am moved emotionally. Um, and I was thinking about that after watching this film, how incredible it is that something that happened in my life, you know, decades ago still can produce that reaction in me. But like when I see a character in a film face that moment where they have to get honest about their addiction and mm-hmm. they understand how it has just tore their life apart. I think that's the part that affects me the most. And when you see a really good actor portray that, like they did in this film, I can't help but be moved by it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I would imagine, I think that's a good tool. If I, if I had a counselor, um, you know, have me watch a film, I think that's a really good way of reaching people because um, it certainly touches me. I mean, even after all these years. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of the guys too in treatment would be like, "Oh, great, we get to watch a movie," and then mm-hmm. you know, it it wasn't it wasn't that simple. You know, we'd have like a pretty hardcore process group after it. So, um, I always, you know, I always had a thought of having like an AA thing like that, like an AA meeting where everybody got together for a couple hours and watched a movie and then talked about it like a meeting like that. I just, you know, it's funny you say that because we're actually doing that in Kansas City now um, on a quarterly basis. We're having a movie night. Um, and we started, I have, I missed it because I totally spaced it out, but we had our first one, like, um, the first, uh, Friday in uh, September and we just watched the movie Bill W, but mm-hmm. the next movie is going to be, um, that Denzel Washington movie, um, Oh, flight. Yeah. And smashed is on our agenda to watch too. So every, every, um, three months we're, we're doing this and it's like, we have, we've rented the space for like two hours and then we send a flyer out to invite the rest of the AA community, and we just watch the movie. Um, we don't do any discussion of it or anything like that, I don't think. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I think it's a good tool. You know, when I was first um, stopping drinking, there was a movie that came out, um, and I'm clean and sober. And um, I watched that, and I swear to God, Ben, I think I was, I was, I, I think I was in my first month of sobriety. I was just really, really fresh, and that movie also impacted me at that time um and and i'll never forget the scene what scene it was it was the scene when he came back to his apartment and after his girlfriend had od'd and um there were like um someone pasted like papers all over his house you know Mm -hmm. um and it was just that humiliation and then also when he had to face his boss things like that just I mean, when you can identify with something and then you can see that, like in that case, it was just the terror and fear that he was dealing with. So yeah, oh, yeah. I think films are powerful, really powerful. stuff. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I also, I want to apologize for anybody who felt maybe a little triggered by this movie. I put a little post on the Facebook group and I should have maybe warned people a little bit. Um, some of us have a tough time really seeing 
drinking or uh, you know this emotional stuff. So sometimes it's good to be prepared for it. But yeah, um, can you tell me a little bit about that, Ben? I I might be kind of new to this. It seems like um like uh, I'm starting to see now, like on social media, people say trigger warning and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, because I never, um, I mean, I guess I understand. I've heard it like in meetings, like like crack addicts, for example, if they even see. You know, somebody, um, if they even see crack, I mean, it's, it's, it, 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 it triggers this reaction in them, I guess. Um, right. I suppose it depends on where you're at. Like in, if you can, if you can say there's such a thing as stages of recovery, like early on, I think a lot of people even watching people drink, it's hard for them not to get a craving, but you yeah. know, where, where I'm at right now, it's like, I'm able to reflect and put it in perspective and it's like, oh man, that was me or you know, that, that, that can even be a bad feeling for some people, you know, sure. if there's no resolving of that feeling. But. True. And maybe people need to kind of be prepared for it to kind of, you know, they don't want to be shocked of that, that they're getting into something. But, yeah, yep. you know, I'll watch things um, like I'll watch movies <clears throat> that um, might be on a topic that I've experienced, uh, maybe a painful topic. But mm-hmm. I don't know, for me, I almost welcome the emotion. But mm-hmm. um, that's just me, you know, and, and I understand that there could be other people that could see something that could, um, you know, provoke maybe a traumatic um, stress type, you know, those hormones. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So well, anyway. I know, especially with drug addiction, you know, I've had different guys that I've held through the years who, you know, even to watch their own blood be drawn with a needle was wow. a huge trigger, you know, so, uh, well, yeah, that makes sense. You know, um, I was actually watching this, um, uh, a, a video of this doctor who was talking about the science of addiction and she was talking about these studies that they do of, um, where they image the brain of addicts and, um, how certain um, parts of the brain, um, are activated, you know, when they use, or even if they see the image of a drug. Yep. that that part of their brain um, it gets activated, you know, so there's science behind it. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose let's talk a little bit about the film. I know you said I was going to kind of lead here a yeah. little bit, but, but I'm just, I'm going to um, ask you just first, what, what was your impression overall? And what are, what are some of your thoughts you're left with after watching it? And as you went through watching it? Well, I, I liked the movie a lot. I thought the acting was was done really well. Um, I guess I'm always amazed if I watch a movie about addiction and when I can relate to the characters so well, I think, wow, that person did a really good job playing this part. Um, there, were, I guess, um, there, I'll just go through it really quickly. Um, first of all, I think the movie really centered around the relationship and how um, um, when um, Kate was getting um, sober, how that affected her marriage because her husband Eric wasn't going, wasn't getting sober. Mm-hmm. And um, so that, that's, that's part of the dynamic, which was interesting, but also like I was saying before, that whole process of the person becoming honest about, you know, having, having to confront the truth about what's going on with them um, mm-hmm. and then dealing with people outside. There was one moment in the movie that kind of, uh, there were a couple of moments that disturbed me and I'll talk about those, I guess. One moment mm-hmm. was when um, the um, her friend at school um, told her about the meeting, mm-hmm. right? And I thought, okay, that's cool. And But then after the meeting, he was hitting on her. Mm-hmm. Uh, that really bothered me that... Yeah. You know, but I guess I guess it was good that they put it in the movie because I I know that that's an issue in twelve step programs. But that really kind of creeped me out a little bit, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then another scene that that got me thinking was when she finally came, when she came clean with her um, boss at work, the principal. Mm-hmm. You know, she she confessed to her lying about you know getting sick in front of the kids and everything. Mm-hmm. And at first, her boss was acting like, "Oh, there must be something seriously wrong with you. You must have, you know, uh, a serious illness. You know, what's wrong with you?" And she was acting right. very compassionate. And then when Kate um, said that she's an alcoholic, mm-hmm. well, her boss turned completely, lost all compassion. And became very um, judgmental and very harsh in her reaction to um, what happened and fired her. Right. You know, if, if, if she'd come out and said, you know, I have cancer or I have, you know, I've got this or that, 
maybe the boss would have been more understanding. <laughs> right. My, wa- my wife and I were talking about that last night. And I think even if she would have said I was drunk that night and hung over versus saying I'm an alcoholic, ah, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Then yep. it maybe would have been even more acceptable. It, it was, and you know, this is getting way too far into it, but it's, yeah. I, I would imagine there's some kind of legal protection that if if this really is a disease by medical standards on some level, which I debate in my own head, but mm-hmm. uh, you know it would be like I don't know if you could fire somebody for that necessarily. But anyhow, yeah. yeah, it is it is interesting because that woman was pretty compassionate towards her, but then her compassion towards her was also because she couldn't have children, right? So so she was felt kind of violated, I think, because she had lied about that part of it too. So right. Yeah, yeah. yeah and just kind of, just to mm-hmm. just to fill people in who didn't watch the movie yet, um, she's a teacher and she she comes to school and she's super hungover and she's actually been drinking in the morning to try and get over the hangover, and then she vomits in the classroom in front of all her I think first grade kids is what she teaches. So then um, she lies to the kids and tells them she's pregnant because she's embarrassed that she threw up in front of them. And I thought I thought this was so dead on because like. In the rooms, lots of times it gets made out to be like, you're a liar, you're a thief, you're this, you're that. Well, the lies aren't always, you know, intentional. Like, that lie is to try and protect those kids. Right. But mm-hmm. it, it doesn't mean it, it fills you with shame. You feel like you're violating yourself by lying about something. And that's that's how, like, substance abuse and alcoholism and all that stuff, That's those are the subtle ways in which it affects us. You know, you lie to somebody about where you were the night before just because you don't want someone to know how much drinking you did or, mm-hmm. you know, and then you're keeping track of all these things you've exactly. told different people. And yeah, exactly. it, it kind of just tears you apart a little bit. It does. And it's, it is very, very difficult because you, once you, once you tell a lie about to cover up for something that you did um, related to your addiction, um, you have to perpetuate that. You have to, mm-hmm. you know, because that person tells someone else, tells them, and then next thing, you know, that's that's the narrative that you have to somehow keep going, <laughs> and right. and you become sort of like an actor, you know, play play replaying right. the scene for people. Right. You know, I did that. Um, it kind of reminded me when I was um, when I when I got fired from my job. You know, I um, I couldn't make it into work because um, I was in jail. You know, from mm-hmm. from a drunk driving arrest. And, um, my immediate, uh, manager who, um, was someone I actually drank with on the job and stuff, he got me out of jail, but he didn't, that was all he did. He, he, he got me out, um, and then he left. Mm -hmm. Um, and I agreed that I'd come up with this, um, story that, uh, my dad had a heart attack or something. It was Mm -hmm. really embarrassing, but I, that was the story. And, and I had to stick with it, and um, I had to tell all these people, and they were very sympathetic, just like they were to, to Kate in the movie, you know. And, right. Um, and then finally, you know, I had that scene like she did, where I where mm-hmm. the truth came out. Right. Oh God. And I did well, the same thing she did. She said, she said, "I'm going to twelve step program. I'm doing this and that." And and I actually wasn't at the time, but I was intending to. I did call right. her, but I said, "I'm going," you know, and I was hoping that that would save me that they would understand that oh wow this poor guy he's really screwed up he's but he's trying to turn his life around right we'll give him another chance but no they wouldn't um but yeah well, those lies i understand how how it works well and that's where this rigorous honesty you know i get it and um sometimes i wonder if it's always good to admit that truth like she did to her boss you know because some people don't always understand and i don't know that it's necessarily lying now this is a change for me i used to be like you know i agree with you you, you gotta go and tell the absolute truth and you know no, you don't. i mean we can i think we have to put ourselves in other people's perspective no. just like her boss in this film that was a, a the word alcoholism or the fact that she had alcoholism was a, a big thing for her that she just couldn't get over. And it was like, that's when she went to judging her. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I don't think we need to be blatantly lying all the time, but I don't know that bearing our soul constantly to everybody who may not have any idea what perspective we're coming from Absolutely. is always a healthy, healthy I advice. I totally agree with you. Um, she should not have come out to her boss like that. Uh, mm-hmm. because that was impacting her livelihood, you know, but she, mm-hmm. she, it was, it was bothering her conscience. And I think that mm-hmm. she felt like she had to do something. I did something similar actually after a couple of years of sobriety and actually approached my employer about something I had done and, um, eh, oh, whatever. But, yeah. um, there was a couple of scenes in there 
about um, honesty. Another scene that that honesty that that didn't need to have to happen. Like she did not have to come out to her boss like that. She could have found another way to get to get through that. Um, mm-hmm. But another another scene of honesty that wasn't handled well was when um, her friend from school. Um, came came on to her and then mm-hmm. and then tried to justify it by being honest about how screwed up he is. Right, right. Like that was going to forgive the whole damn thing or something. Right. That was really that's what that that creeped me out a lot. Mm-hmm. That scene and I think part of it was because of the way he was acting. Like, oh, I'm I have problems and I I'm just so bad. You know, all that kind of crap. Right, right. <sighs> I like how the movie handled that though, because it it he did care about her. He did care about people getting sober if they wanted to. He wasn't a pushy AA person, but right. he he did have that kind of uh, slight awkwardness, right? Like yeah. that was that was why he said what he said the way he said to her on some level. Again, not to justify it because that's not good either, but it didn't make him out to be just a creep. Like even right. these creepers in twelve step recovery, it's I mean. Yeah, I don't want to justify what they do sometimes either, but it's no. it's not all bad or all good, I guess. Right. You know, I don't, I don't know. It's just like I I guess I could see. I mean, I know what I know the character. I've met people like that. There's a little bit of me in that. Mm-hmm. Um and 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 maybe the guy after a few more years um would overcome whatever that that issue was, but he definitely had some underlying issues that he needed to deal with, I mean, you know, maybe outside of the 12 step program. Mm-hmm. Um, but just the way I, that the way that he was kind of, it seemed to me like he was trying to s- say, I'm really a good person who's working on myself. Right. And, right. And, and that's what, so please excuse my behavior, you know, whatever. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, um, maybe I'll just walk through, I wrote some notes down while okay. I was watching the movie and, uh, maybe we'll walk, th- I guess we'll just kind of walk through the movie a little bit chronologically, but, Sounds good. um, yeah, at the beginning of the film, we're seeing how, I guess, Dr. Drew will put it like this when I listen to his mm-hmm. podcast, like her her drinking is gaining momentum, you know, like she's, and, and like you said, it's a function of their relationship too, like you can tell they probably both met and both like to drink mm-hmm. a lot, and, you know, when we form relationships around that foundation, it can be, I don't know, it's just really rocky foundation to, to found things on, mm-hmm. and and then you know at the end of the night she leaves the bar and ends up with a giving a ride to a woman and then she ends up hanging out with people she normally wouldn't have hung out with and then uh she smokes crack and that's the thing for her that was like holy cow I'd never thought I would be someone who smoked crack and um yeah I think she even woke up on a I think it was a front seat of a car that was yeah. sitting out in the middle of nowhere right yeah. like downtown right and, um, you know, I, I had moments like that when I drank, like waking up on some couch or I remember one time I woke up in my car in the parking lot of an apartment that I had no idea where I was. Yeah. Like, I think I just was driving and I was drunk and I thought, shit, I need to pull over and sleep. Yeah. And that's what I did. And then that, that unsettling feeling of being like, holy shit, what, this is bad. What's, yep. what's going on? You know, or people are like, you didn't come home last night. Where were you? Or man. Yeah. I woke up one time, um, actually underneath a car in somebody's driveway mm-hmm. and crawled out of underneath the car, somehow got to my car, somehow got home and took a shower and then stumbled into work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. And then you sit there about 10, you kind of catch yourself and you're like, holy shit, that was uh, a crazy it's evening. It's a crazy life. Yeah. So I, I kind of, when she was, when she was having, she had a couple of those experiences where she had just like come to out, of, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, I understand. And then, and then after that, like her and her husband are doing what they probably do on weekends. They go down to like the local pool hall and they're right. having beers and drinking after she had that experience. And she's talking to him and saying, you know, look, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I need to slow down while she's drinking beer, you know, right. like that, that seemed accurate to me too. It's like you, you go through these processes of, um, or stages of change, I guess in the counseling profession, they call them where you're contemplating changing And then you're taking action towards changing or you're planning to change and then you take Mm -hmm. action to change. And she's really in that contemplative state right there because she's like, yeah, I'm sitting here drinking and but I've got to chill out. And then she tells her husband that she smoked crack the night before and 
That's really feels really embarrassed. Then, how you have how you just said that how you have stages of that you go through when you're making a change in your life. Um, I think that's really true. I never really thought about it, but that's true. Yeah. Like for almost anything, like you know, if you're getting ready to you know to lose weight or yeah. start exercising, you do go through that contemplative stage, don't you? Yeah, for sure. And if I mean, if you ever want anybody wants to look it up, just Google stages of change, and yeah. you'll see the stages of change. And you know, you can sit in those stages for a long time. Like I could yeah. sit. Oh, right now, I'm sitting here contemplating how I need to exercise right. more, and I've I been. Mean that. I've been doing that for way too long. I need to get into some uh, preparation and action there. So interesting. It's really yeah. kind of good to be aware of that. That you know, when you do, when you are in that stage, that's that's a good thing. You know, and you know, because yeah. so, sometimes, um, you know, even in AA, you know, we go through that. Like, you know, I oh, remember yeah. when with me when it was like going through the fourth step, and my sponsor would be harassing me because I wasn't going, you know, proceeding. I was procrastinating, all that kind of crap. But maybe I was going through that stage of, you know, kind of preparing myself for it. And, and, mm-hmm. and maybe, maybe you know, maybe that's a natural thing. Um, but you do probably sometimes need to kind of move from one stage to the next. Maybe you do need help with that, I guess. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, som- sometimes we need prompting. But I appreciate what you're saying because it is true. Some people... S- need to sit there and marinate in that a little bit longer before they take the action. So yeah, I think you do I think you have to kind help, of prepare but... yourself for it. And in a way yeah. it's kind of respectful, you know, if you're doing something like a four step or whatever, that you're taking the process serious enough, you know, right. to, to, to think about it. I don't know. Anyway. Well, and I've, I've run into this, well, as a counselor for sure, but it's just as a friend of people who are drinking too much or something, that's where being assertive and just expressing concern to someone about their drinking can be the beginning of that stage of change for someone. It's like, and Kate in this where she's drinking beer and talking with her husband about wanting to chill out, just verbalizing it is mm. a huge step. Even yeah, if you're not ready you're to right. do anything about it, to be able to admit that to somebody else or verbalize it and take it out of your head, because I'm sure she'd been having those thoughts for quite a while. Yep. And and just saying it to someone, and there's where I think this fellowship aspect of AA is so huge. And we can just listen to each other, go through that stuff. Yep. Like how many people did I have walk into the rooms and talk to me for a while and make contact with me for a couple of weeks? And then I either never heard from them or I didn't hear from them again until a year later. There, I, there's benefit to that, even because mm-hmm. they didn't stick around and do the deal at that time. It's it's that That's part of their process sometimes. Yeah. So um, I, I thought that was really good. And then, like you said, so much of this is dealing with, um, you know, while she's trying to get sober and her husband's not. I mean, at that point, it, he definitely drank too much, right? I'm not going to yeah. say he's alcoholic or not. I think he probably was. But he wasn't ready to, to quit and hadn't had as many problems from it as she probably had at that point. Right. So that it was so accurate because I was in a relationship right when I was getting sober and my partner was – she was still drinking and it was, it was difficult. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you're around somebody who's drinking sometimes or, and it deals with his awkward feelings too, of being around her while he's still drinking and, and she's not, and she's trying to do the AA thing. And, you know, there's the one time where he's drunk with his friends after, you know, we realize he has violated her confidence and told his friends that she smoked crack and he, this was a really powerful scene, I thought. And he said, I fucking hate AA. It has yeah. made you a bitch. Yeah. And she said, well, at least I'm not drunk all the time. And then they have the argument about all that and dealing with someone being kind of drunk and coming on to you, even though you're married to them. And mm-hmm. how, you know, even to smell alcohol when I was first getting sober, like, it wasn't yeah. a trigger to me, but it was just annoying. Like, it's like, right. you're aware of it. You're like hyper aware of it. Yeah. yeah, and you realize that somebody's taking an action towards you that they wouldn't necessarily take if yep. they weren't drunk, or you were a part of this drunken sex hookup, you know, at the same time, and it's just like two drunk people getting lost in each other, and it's just, it feels really false and inauthentic, and to be really present in your own skin and aware, it, yeah. it's, it's a huge, tough thing when we're first getting sober. It is. Um, the way I used to put it... Um, if I uh, walked into a room <clears throat> and there was a bottle of beer on, on a table, um, it would be like um, walking into a room and there's a gun on the table. It mm-hmm. would be like this. It'd be like, okay, I, I'm, I'm very aware that there's a gun on the table. You know? Right. You cannot yes. ignore that there's a freaking gun on the table. Well, that's the same way it is with me. If I walk into the room and there's a bottle of whiskey on the table, I can't right. 
get, you know, and maybe there's someone else that can walk into a room and there's a bottle of whiskey on the table and it doesn't, it doesn't have that same reaction, but it, right. it but it does for, it does for me. Yeah. Something I wanted to say about that though, you know, about how their relationship was affected. Um, I think that our personalities change uh, a lot when we um, stop using. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't know if it's because the the addiction itself has kind of warped our personalities, um, but, but, but something changes in us. We're no longer the same person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was the thing with her relationship is that he wasn't, moving even if he got into recovery he would be a different person too right you you really do change i think and i don't mm-hmm. and i don't think it's really like the psychic change of the working the steps or anything i think that's our brains chemically change right um from how we our brains are used from when we're when we're addicts and when we're not, and when we're um, not using any longer and just that change in personality i think absolutely would make the would have an impact on the relationship Right. Well, and I, I agree with you, but also I'm going to go, I don't even want to say devil's advocate because I think it's, this is such a intermesh thing. There's so many things going on. I always saw, and I, this is more my belief about it is that my drinking was to try and be something that I wasn't mm-hmm. on some level or, or, or on other levels who I really was, you know, it like allowed me to be who I was, but it was, I felt like I was running away from walking my path and being me by drinking. Right. And I felt like I was just kicking that can down the road and pushing that off. And then so drunk Ben or drinking Ben was like, it felt so inauthentic to who I was in so many ways. And it was like on some level mm. I felt, I felt bad about who I truly was for no good reason. Like I just had this feeling that whoever I was not drinking was not okay. And I yeah. think now that I've been sober for a while, it's like it's more about learning to just be okay with who I am, what I value, what I believe in, including this whole atheism thing, mm-hmm. um, and and things like that, and being authentic to that. And mm-hmm. so, yes, I think alcohol changed my personality, but I think I also used alcohol to run away from who I really was yeah. because I either felt shameful about it for no good reason or for good reason. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think the process of AA – can help us become somebody different. But I think more of what it is, I, it's getting it's back helped, to who you are. Yeah. It's, it's helped me reveal to myself who I really yes, am. And I, I think that's become okay true. with that too. Yep. But I, I, but I do true. agree with you because the chemicals and the alcohol, it does change who we are. Right. And, and I'll roll that in. I know you got something else to say about that, right. but I'll roll that into when, um, after she gets fired, mm-hmm. she kind of predictably goes out and relapses. Right. Mm hmm. Yep. And then she comes back and uh, her husband's been, I don't know, having a couple of beers, but he is definitely not drunk. Mm-hmm. And she's hammered, right? Mm-hmm. And then all of her true fe- – I'll, I'll call them her true feelings – come shooting out at him when she's drunk. Yeah. And um, that seems so very accurate to me. Like she was saying, I can't stay sober because of you. And he's yelling at her, well, don't blame your problems on me, which is true. And then she kind of rephrases it. And she says, I can't be sober and be with you. So there is like the elephant in the room this whole time where he's still been drinking and she hasn't is both of them see this sobriety as a threat to their relationship. Yeah. And and it is. Mm-hmm. It, it absolutely is. And I know when I was in that really bad relationship, right when I was getting sober, she would try to sabotage my sobriety because I think uh, subconsciously she knew that if I was to stay sober, we probably weren't going to stay together. Right. And that was that was the truth. Yep. And I look back at those times and we had some huge, huge arguments when she was drunk and I was sober. And I, I really, I wonder, I look back and I wonder how I stayed sober through that. Like, mm-hmm. and it wasn't like, oh my God, I'm going to go drink. But it was like, I don't know how... I must have, and I have to thank AA for this because it helped me realize that I had a problem and nothing was going to change if I kept drinking. But I mean, I look back at all that crap that was going on and it's like, holy cow, how did I stick to my guns and just continue to do what I was doing at that time, going to AA and staying sober? I mean, I, I do I have to thank the people of AA and AA for that. But yeah, it's very true. Drinking would almost be, like it would be easy to drink in that situation because who wants to give up a marriage? Who wants to... And I'm not saying you have to give up a marriage if you're right. sober, 
but it, but it is getting sober can be a very threat, a huge yep. threat to a relationship that was built on two people who went out and partied quite a bit together. Yep. Yep. I see that in other movies too, where there's um, relationships involved with people who are coming um, out of an addiction. And I think off the top of my head was a man loves a woman. And I've talked about that one before mm-hmm. where their relationship is like totally, you know, threatened and changed because of um, her getting sober. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I, I didn't experience that because I, I, I wasn't in any relationship, you know, um, mm-hmm. at all, you know, when I was uh, drinking and w- when I was getting sober and I'm glad because that would be a really difficult dynamic to have to deal with, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Big time. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And then another scene, I thought, well, so many great scenes in this movie, um, uh, when they go to visit her mother and oh. she asks him to not drink when they go to visit her mother. And we can see where she kind of grew up. I mean, her mom's having Bloody Marys in the middle of the day. And as soon as they show up, she says, oh, it's time for us all to have a Bloody Mary, you know? Yeah. And uh, I think then even her mom, her dad must have left her mom after he got sober and went and had a family. And she goes, oh, dear God, you're going to Assholes Anonymous. I forgot about that. You're right. Yeah. So she was resentful because she lost her husband who got sober. I forgot about that. that. I I remember that scene, but I totally forgot about her resentment about that. Yeah. yeah. And then she warns, uh, she warns Kate's husband. You better watch out. The, oh, they wow. change when they get sober. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Yep. That, that was then interesting. even after that, the second time around, I noticed this and I didn't the first time, but after she had stuck her guns and said she wasn't drinking and explained it to her mom, they're all hanging out on the couch and they're kind of having a nice moment together. Like her mom is showing a little bit of tenderness to her and she goes and she takes her husband and shows him some of the places she grew up. Mm-hmm. And they're completely sober, and they're yeah. having a nice time together. That was a very small little part, but I noticed that this time around. Yeah, that was an important part of the movie. You know, she she felt a need to see her mother, and obviously, you know, they had strain, a strained relationship. You know, and but she she felt a need to see her mother and talk about this. Mm-hmm. So I can understand that. I remember wanting to <clears throat> go to my dad and and talk to him and tell him what I was doing as well. So right, uh, yeah, yeah, that's probably totally natural. And I think it becomes more real at that point because you've kind of made, it's not a commitment, but when you tell it to somebody that you care about, it's not like you can start drinking again later and be like, oh yeah, I was just having a crazy moment at that time when I told you I was going to AA and trying to stay sober. Yeah. You know, it's it's kind of a sign of actually you're committing to wanting to be sober. Yeah. As I look through my notes here, um, yeah, I got that like in the early period, sometimes we look like fun haters to everybody else or... You know, I can remember when I quit drinking, too, um, the times before I actually quit, um, people would assume I was on some moral crusade and thought that alcohol was bad. Mm. And, um, you know, that wasn't always the case. I just kind of knew that I couldn't drink. Yeah. You know what I did? I um, <clears throat> I did have a couple of friends, I guess, from when I was drinking. Um, but um, they I, they weren't really real close friends. But I, I, I just... Um, I just kind of moved on, uh, but but I just I just left and and, and mm-hmm. I just disappeared from their lives, uh, and and started afresh. Um, uh, and then part of that I think is you know we talked about this before is my uh, my up, upbringing as a military brat that I can kind of do that. Um, I can just kind of say okay, moving. <laughs> right, <laughs> These right. People are I won't ever see them again. You know, so right. I kind of I kind of did that with them and. Um, Which is probably good and bad, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was probably it probably made it easier for me, um, in a way, because I I didn't have um, this this I didn't feel this need to somehow reconnect with the people that I was drinking with and somehow mm-hmm. explain to them why I was sober or anything. But right. even in my case, there weren't very many. There there were only yeah. a few guys that I can think of, you know, that yeah. I hung out with in any anyway. Yeah. And then uh, also like her first experience going to the meeting and she actually speaks. Um, mm-hmm. I wrote down some of the quotes of what she said. And I always I love it when newcomers come to a meeting and are just talking without, you know, here's what you say when you're in an AA meeting. Yeah. She said, uh, everyone I know drinks a lot. She said, I just want to have a beer without it turning into 20. Yeah. And then she said, uh, the other night things, things went from kind of embarrassing to kind of scary. Yeah. So that was when she scared herself with smoke and crack and waking up on that you know, front seat of that car. That's, that's one scene where I started crying and, mm-hmm. um, uh, it's kind of funny. It's interesting, I guess. Um, cause I've seen that, I've seen people do that in AA meetings in, in real life and I don't, I don't 
I don't tear up and cry, but for some reason in a movie, when she was doing that, um, it triggered me to have that emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. Um, I think part of it was because she was young and it kind of took me back when um, I was that age and dealing with that kind of stuff. I don't know what it was, but that really, that really affected me quite a bit. Well, her acting was so good too. I think in that role, Um, a good, good actor. Yeah. And um, then she asked the woman to be her sponsor. And I liked how they kind of showed their relationship a little bit, too. And it wasn't I mean, I wish I heard more things like that in AA meetings. It's like I, I, I've said this before, but I like like a little bit of a small group feel to yeah. my meetings <laughs> I go to where it's not just dogma and people can share what they're really feeling. And um, yeah, and that that her sponsor said to her, like, yeah, we can do this. I can show you how this works, but it's OK if we just talk sometimes, too. Yeah, that's, that's you know? yeah, that was a good, that was a good sponsor. Um, you know, we've talked about the whole sponsorship thing in AA, which is really problematic. I think when you have the, the sponsor who says, okay, this is what you're going to do and you better mm-hmm. do it. You know, that that's the totally wrong thing to, in, in my opinion. And this sponsor mm-hmm. though, yeah, you're right. She said, yeah, you know, I'll be there for you. I'm your friend, you know, um, you know, I understand, you know, that that's what people need. I think. Um, yeah. 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 I like that scene too. And then, uh, oh, I just wanted to get your take. My wife and I were talking about it last night. Not that it matters. Mm -hmm. I know some people have already expressed on the Facebook group about, like, not liking the ending because it is kind of one of those ambiguous endings. I Uh, liked it because, you know, it's not your typical Hollywood ending where they (laughs) where everything everything's happy and and resolved and and they ride off into the sunset together. Right. You know, uh, and there are some other movies that end like that, too, where where, you know. Uh, you you get say okay this is how it, this is the way it is you know um i liked the ending because th- there was a lot going on there um right. wow um first of all you know um what happened was um she had that relapse and then a, and then and then she celebrated a year of sobriety and after mm-hmm. the, i guess that year of sobriety um you know her marriage um they got separated and everything and she went back to see him and he was obviously still wanting her back Right. And yeah. let's say, too, he was just arrested, I think. for oh, That's right. For being drunk and riding yeah. a bike and drunk and disorderly yep. and all that kind of crap. So his life is still a mess. And he really wanted her back. And um, I could see that she knew that that could never happen. Uh, but she also, I, I, I sensed that she could feel a lot of, she understood where he was coming from. And mm-hmm. it pained her to see see that. Um, but they weren't, they weren't going to get back together. And I, I guess, I mean, if people were bothered by the ending, is it because they didn't get back together? I mean, it just ended with her. I mean, she was okay. And, and, um, I guess, you know, the, the viewer of the movie can, can kind of put in their own imagination how things happen from there. I mean, maybe, maybe that would help him finally, uh, deal with his own issues, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and maybe, you know, they could make a sequel where he, right. <laughs> he gets sober or something, you know, but, um, I don't know. I, I thought it was a very <clears throat> powerful ending. I thought it, it it gave you something to think about. I mean, I thought there was a lot, a lot going on in that scene. Oh yeah. That, well, and let's say they were, they were in the backyard playing, uh, I can't remember what they were playing, but they were playing a game in the backyard together, talking like they always used to when they were half drunk all the time. Mm hmm. And talking, and he says, would you move back in if I went to meetings? And she said the whole thing that many of us have said, well, you know, you need to you need to go to meetings for you, not to try and get me back or whatever. Right. And then, um, yeah. And he's, I think even before that, he said something like, I just wish we were meeting again for the first time now, and I could take you out on a date. And she said, that can't happen, like you said. And then um, people change. I mean, yeah. they, <clears throat> there was no way she was not the same person that she was in that relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, their whole relationship was built around their drinking and drugging mm-hmm. or not drugging in this case it was all drinking. But um, yeah, um, I, I can get it. I mean, I, I understand. I, you know, I have um, I have someone in my family who's drinking and my mom mm-hmm. or brother and it's. It's di- it's weird. It's different, you know. I mean, I love him and I want him, you know, but it's hard to have that 
it's it's just how you know i can't just hang out you know <laughs> yeah does he do you see have an issue you think john yeah absolutely yeah does. yeah he is does. this the one that's kind of a hardcore fundamentalist like yes. the one you couldn't tell that you were an atheist too probably yes. yeah and now, and now he he knows um but uh and, and maybe he's gonna do something i don't know but um it, it, it is kind of sad you know um but he he came to see me in jacksonville when i was down there oh because okay. he's from florida Mm-hmm. And it was good to see him, but, uh, and, and, and there was, it was kind of nice. He did come out and, um, you know, share openly that he had relapsed and stuff like that. So, so that was mm-hmm. good. But, um, I don't know these, these relationships with family and stuff, they're, they're very, there's a lot, there's a lot of baggage. And, um, I mean, there, there was a lot that there's a lot that I need to deal with on this. You know, I need to, um, I think I was in self-preservation mode, you know, um, and mm-hmm. just kind of dealing with it like that. But um, I wasn't very, I wasn't very compassionate towards him, I guess. And maybe I need to do, I don't know. I don't know. I was, I was mm-hmm. totally self-preservation, just taking care of myself. So, and that's what mm-hmm. she's kind of doing, you know? Yeah. Well, and there is that time where it's like, that's what we have to do. Like she, she definitely was in that self-preservation, like, uh, and, and that's where it leaves us at the end of the movie. Right. She's kind of like, it leaves you wondering, Oh, cause I think he asked her to stay and play one more game. And then it closes up on her face and you can see her wrestling with whether she should right, not just play another game with him. Right. But like, what does that mean? Are we going to, you know, give this another chance or we not, or we what not? And I thought it was so accurate because no matter how well we seem like we're doing, you know, if you see somebody in meetings and they're saying all the right things and they sound like they're good, they, this, that, it can be just as quick as that, like making a decision to go back out with somebody or getting in a relationship too soon or this or that. And that can rock us off that foundation that we've been doing pretty well on. So, And I kind of like- thought that she could see how desperate he was to get back with her. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't just, I mean, he was, he was really, he really needed her, you know, and it was just tearing him apart Mm -hmm. that he lost her. And I think that she could see that. And I think that she felt some, she said she felt bad for him. I thought, I thought. Yeah. Well, and now in their relationship, even though she was probably the one that had more of a problem, but not necessarily, it just showed itself in a different way. She was probably more of the caretaker of him than he was of her. Cause like we learned that his mm-hmm. family had a lot of money and that's why they had the house that they ho- had. And, oh, but he just, part. yeah, he just kind of writes stories and hangs out and goes, you know, to see bands and gets drunk right. most nights. Right. Yeah. And she's kind of the responsible one with the job as a teacher. Yeah. And, you know, so she, he was more lost without her. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. I kind of, I, I missed that. I, I saw that he had some kind of a job where he was like, uh, he a writer and re, he would review bands and stuff like that. But I kind of missed out on the part that he, you know, was enabled, you know, um, to, you know, he didn't have to really work or anything like that if he didn't mm-hmm. want to, I guess. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, the, it's just the whole relationship thing is always a very complicated thing. Yeah. So, so for her, I'm wondering, and this is way reading into it, but like for her, if she <laughs> was kind of caretaking him on some level, probably, it would be dangerous for her to give back in and go back oh, in that yeah. relationship just because he's so hurt. Like it's yeah. like for that oh, to work, yeah. the two people need to be kind of independently working on their own stuff rather yep. than him doing it just because he's back with her. Yep. And she may, maybe she recognized that too, that that was part of her problem, you know, being yeah. that caretaker person. And it's just, it's those little decisions that can, that can be big ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But overall, you know, I, Super powerful movie. I love these independent films that are made for not much money that are shot really quickly. I think I looked, this film was shot in 17 days. Wow. So, you know, it's amazing. It was, yeah, it was a small little Sundance film. I mean, and it shows, I mean, but it's very well done, I think. And oh, yeah. I, I, that's incredible I, over such a short time that they, that they could do that. that they, I didn't even know that's so even possible, but that really oh, gosh, excellent yeah. acting. Um, yeah. I mean, really amazing film, I thought. Yep. Yeah, I, if anybody hasn't watched it out there, I mean, I would definitely recommend it. It's it's one of those movies that's not it's not going to beat you in the face with stuff, but mm-hmm. like there are some hardcore raw emotional truths, you yeah. know. And I tell you, there's a lot of value <clears throat> to um, watching these movies and discussing them and relating them to our own recovery and mm-hmm. being able to relate to the characters and everything. I think I think it's a kind of a powerful thing to powerful tool and 
you know, I hope that there, you know, are some people out there listening who, you know, might be coming to terms with their addiction for the first time. And maybe, mm-hmm. you know, maybe they might try to do this and, and watch some of these films and, yeah. know, and really watch them, you know, attentively and, and think about, you know, what's going on. Uh, yeah. Wow. And yeah. I, I can, I can <clears throat> say films for me were the first thing that kind of got me thinking a little bit more deeply about my life. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was maybe in my early twenties and just partying all the time and whatnot. And I remember I went to a film and like, it just really touched me and made me think a little bit harder. It was almost like going to an AA meeting and you hear somebody say something you've been thinking for a long time, but you felt like you were the only one. Yeah. That was the power films had for me at that time. too. And it just kind of cracked the door open enough to really take a good, hard, honest look. It's amazing how fiction can get us to do that more than some sponsor just hollering truths in your face. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's something about seeing it on the film or on stage that is very powerful. Um, you know, I, I had the same thing. I love going to plays and I don't, I don't, we have fantastic theater in Kansas city and mm-hmm. I, I need to make an effort to start doing it again. Cause my, my wife and I, we used to go all the time, but there are such powerful um, performances um, that really make you stop and think. And mm-hmm. the thing I like about theater is, um, is that so different from Hollywood is that, you know, they're, they're, they, they are sometimes you watch a play that's really kind of troubling. It really makes it really bothers you. It's not a feel good thing. It doesn't have the happy ending, you know? Um, and I, I kind of, kind of like that. That's one thing, reason I like this movie so much is it was, it was more real, you know, um, mm-hmm. in, in dealing with how things really are. Things aren't, things aren't real cut and dry and clean and, and, you know, always happy ending or whatever, you know? Right. So, Yep. It makes you think. Makes you stop and think. Absolutely. So, John, what's uh, what's been going on new with you and uh, your trip to Jacksonville and all that stuff? What's <laughs> the Jacksonville trip is a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it, and um, they've got a really great um, group down there on, in Jacksonville Beach. And uh, they another meeting is starting up in St. Augustine, and the um, the deal that we did, the workshop we did at the convention was very well received. And uh, there were a lot of people that had been in AA for a long time that never knew about secular meetings. And it was like a real eye-opening experience for them. Changed some people's lives, you know. Nice. So it was really it was really a valuable experience. I'd like to replicate that here in Missouri sometime. I uh, really enjoyed that. Um, I got to tell you, though, I'm, I don't know. I, I, um, I've. I'm changing. I, my AA thing is I'm ever evolving. I, um, I left every single traditional Facebook AA group out there mm-hmm. because I found myself getting really upset. Um, anytime I would try to post something, some dogmatic big book idiot <laughs> would just tear me apart. Mm-hmm. And I said, the hell with this. And then I, so I, I dropped every single one of them. I, I'm only in the secular ones. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm thinking about that. That's so interesting because that's what I've done in real life too. I, you know, I don't go to regular meetings anymore. I absolutely can't sit through the goddamn things. Mm-hmm. And the only meetings I go to are, um, are secular meetings. And I keep telling myself, Oh, I should try. I should really do this or that. And I, and I, and I don't, and, and, and it's just really difficult. Um, and so anyway, I'm trying to write more and I've been writing more. I've been writing for this website that we have for secular AA Kansas city.org is what it's called. And I've been writing mm. and um, I was working on something about, I wrote out these like five things that I do as part of my recovery. Um, and one of those things that I found was important is going to meetings. And I wanted to write about the benefit of going to AA meetings. And I'm thinking I'm, wa- I'm wanting to write to, uh, for the newcomer, for the person who is just now thinking about getting help. And quite frankly, um, I didn't feel comfortable recommending some of these AA meetings. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I started thinking, well, anyway, the person who's going to come to the site anyway is probably looking for a secular meeting. So I can talk about that, but I don't know how a person like an atheist, it, it's so difficult for them to deal with AA. I, I, all the praying and all that kind of crap, you know, that's one thing they didn't show in this movie. They, a lot of times in these movies, they don't show that they don't right. show, you know, ending with the Lord's prayer and crap like that, you know? Um, but that's the reality. You know, you go to AA and people talk about God and higher power all the time. And if you're an atheist, 
how does this work for me? So I'm mm-hmm. really kind of, I'm still kind of struggling with that. I'm still trying to come to terms with my place in AA. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I'm on the fringe of AA. I'm, 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 I've got one foot in and one foot out, it seems, you know, um, mm-hmm. and, and I, I'm just kind of sitting with that right now and trying to figure things out. But yeah, I guess I'm comfortable with our secular AA stuff, but mm-hmm. Alcoholics Anonymous altogether has a lot of problems as far as I'm concerned. I have a real hard time with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that resonates with me a lot, John. I, I, yeah, sometimes I feel like a phony talking about <laughs> AA all the time as, as many things as I disagree with that go on about it. But you know, we just have to keep, I, I just have to keep in my head that, you know, we have a right to have meetings the way we want them and we have yeah. a right to look at recovery the way we want to. And, and, um, I, no matter what, with the whole secular movement mm-hmm. and AA and everything, if it, if it gives people permission just to continue to be a member and stay sober without, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater and just saying, fuck it all, I'm going to drink. That's great. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's uh, to me, when I hear you talk about it, it, it sounds like you're taking a more universal tone or things are evolving into more of seeing the truth. The truths in AA that you do agree with and find to be true for yourself are more. Right. And it, which makes sense because all this crap was borrowed from tons of other places. It's right. not like AA has a copyright on it. Right. I guess I, I guess you're right. I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, yeah, I'm like, OK, I think I, I think I know what works and uh, what what is effective with AA. And it's totally not the God crap as far as I'm concerned. It's totally not the big book. None of that. But I guess, you know, there are people who do believe that. But I guess my, my whole concern is that um, – there's just seems to be this, like, especially on Facebook, I was feeling it. And I, and, and I've had uh, some real life encounters like this too, where there's no tolerance for the person who, who doesn't want to buy into, who doesn't want to buy into all of it. And mm-hmm. it's like, they always come back to you and say, Oh, well, you must not be an alcoholic or just because you get to stay in our meetings. Doesn't mean that, that this is the way the program is. The program is the way it was in 1939 when Bill and Bob, blah, 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 blah. blah. Right. And it's like, I don't know, man, I just, it just bothers me a lot. I it's, it's weird, you know, um, for all those years I was in the program and, and I, I, it wasn't until I, I came to terms with being an atheist that this kind of, that, that these kind of things would bother me and, and I'd think about it, but it's still a situation now I've been, so I've been, um, an atheist in AA now for, you know, since 2014, I guess. And, um, I'm still, I'm still evolving. I'm still trying to, I'm still f- figuring out where I belong, I guess. It's kind of interesting. Well, and sometimes it feels like trying to be welcome somewhere where you're not welcome. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's tough that way. It is. It is. So, you know, that's what I'm kind of dealing with. And, but I, but I'm okay. You know, I'm, I'm writing more and I like to write. And so that's good. And, 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 and in writing, I can think this about this stuff mm-hmm. and um, I'm still involved in AA. I mean, I, I'm going to go to our district meeting today um, where yeah. I, I get involved with people from other groups. Um, I might uh, join the board of our central office, you know, and help them out. Um, so I'm involved in AA in that, in that way. But if you want me to go to some big book thumping, praying, God talking AA meeting, that's another story. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I have our time with that. It's just, I think the thing that bothers me about it is it feels so phony to me. Like if the only thing you think that's keeping you sober is God, I, I always like to think that the sign of good recovery is if something went away, would you still be okay? Like if AA ended tomorrow, would I have learned the things I've learned and still continue to work them Yeah. with AA being gone? Yeah, yeah I think I would. But like, so if, if somebody came to some of these people one day and said, well, there is no God, like would that shatter your foundation so hard that you'd say, well, screw it all. Right. Well then if, if that's true, then we, I don't, I, we haven't really learned principles or we haven't learned tools that, that work yeah. under all circumstances and all situations. So it's, it's, um, well, I don't know. It's, it's, like, it's, it's supposed care. to be so much more universal. It it's is. not our whole life shouldn't be AA. No, you're right about that. And that's another thing. I, I do need a little bit more balance. I'm, I'm spending way much, way too much time, you know, because of, um, you know, the podcast and the website and, uh, well, yeah, you're so involved. It's hard. Really not to. Am. Yeah. yeah. Although I do enjoy the podcast and I'm, and we're getting back now to doing these on a weekly basis and um, posting them on Wednesdays now instead of on Sundays. So I'm glad about that. Mm-hmm. Another thing, Ben, I'm getting interested in the science of addiction. I was going to ask you about that a little bit. Yeah. Because um, 
I, I read, I um, watched this video uh, by Dr. Nicole Labor, and she works at Summa Healthcare in Akron, Ohio. And she gave this talk in, at Kent State called Addiction 101. And I watched the video a couple times, and she talks about how um, addiction is a dopamine problem, that she says mm-hmm. that no matter what drug you use, whether it be alcohol, cocaine, heroin, um, what happens is, um, and I'm trying to get this right, if you, you, if you have a gene for addiction, um, that gene has to be activated. And mm-hmm. then when you use your drug, your dopamine levels go way above the threshold that's re- that it needs. And next thing you know, your brain starts expecting this dopamine that, that right. you deliver to it through your drug of choice. And then it also, she also talked about how um, your brain changes to where your um, the part of your brain that does the reasoning and the thinking, the front part, the frontal cortex mm-hmm. kind of gets, and you've talked about this before, it gets kind of um, tampered down blocked or whatever and then the part of your brain the very um primal um part of the brain the the back part of the brain whatever uh, mm-hmm. that's the part that takes over the one that that's all about survival you know yeah um and she talked about that so anyway i thought it was really interesting and it kind of made sense to me um and it kind of comported with um what i read in um william porter's book alcohol explained about how the whole addic- addiction cycle works Mm -hmm. Uh, But then again on Facebook, I start posting it and these people are coming out disagreeing with me saying that that's not the current science. So I don't even know what is what is there any agreement uh, on what it is? Well, it's it's hard to say that there is or isn't, but I I do think there is. And the way you're talking about it with that uh, talk that you watched is (laughs) the current thinking for sure. And it makes total sense. So instead of the fact that you're just a selfish asshole who only thinks about yourself, it makes sense that this chemical has been introduced into your body so often that your brain expects it. So you're driven by very seemingly selfish things. And your brain changes because of the problem with your what you know, the, 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 we don't really understand the brain that well but your brain actually changes it's just like you know she talked about in her talk like if you have a brain tumor um people who have brain tumors their behavior changes yeah you know and some and sometimes their family wants what's going on he's being such an asshole and right. then they later find out he's got a brain tumor oh okay we understand yeah. well the same thing happens with addiction you know, our brain changes right. and we start acting out in these weird behaviors and people say, what the hell's wrong with them? And they right. say, oh, he's an, al- he's an alcoholic or he's a drug addict. Oh, he's an asshole. We'll put him in jail. <laughs> right, <know>? right. <laughs> no, you're right. And it's interesting because it kind of goes counter to some of the things you hear in AA because it's such a moralistic yeah. problem, according to the book in many places that yeah. – it's like AA wants to have it both ways. It's like it's a disease and you can't, on some level, you can't help it. But then on the other hand, here's all this moral and spiritual things to help you with, which I don't know. I get so frustrated at all that stuff. But I mean, the science makes sense. That's mm-hmm. what goes on. It's well, We've talked it's about it on here before. It's like, why would somebody do this or do that? It's like, yes, exactly. Why would they? That yeah. tells you it's an issue. It's it's addiction. It's yeah. It makes no sense to people who don't have it. So I was to, I was so I'm um, taken by th- that video and everything. I actually uh, I listened to a podcast that she was on, and then I emailed her from that podcast, asking her if she would be on a podcast with me. And oh, awesome. um, I haven't heard from her, and chances are that maybe that wouldn't be the best way to t- to reach her. So I might try calling her office and see if yeah. maybe that might work. I'm kind of intimidated because she is. Um, you know, she's a lot smarter. Than I am. <laughs> but yeah. I just want someone to come on there and say, Hey, what, tell me about the science, you know, what, what you know, what is going on? What do we know? Right. You know? So it's kind have of you, uh, have you reached out to many of the bigger names in the addiction research at all, John, about, um, being on the podcast, like, you know, uh, Gabor Mate and, I uh, haven't. Johan I, Hari or I haven't, I, I, you know, maybe, maybe I'll try. I'm, I, I guess I, I, I don't have that kind of confidence to talk to people like that. Um, but I am, I have reached out to somebody who is an author. He, he wrote a book called, and I'm really looking forward to this drunks, an American story. And, Mm -hmm. um, his name is Chris Finan and, uh, it's a really incredible book. Um, the guy's a PhD and everything. Anyway, uh, he, he's gonna, um, publish an excerpt of his book on a beyond belief and he's agreed to do a podcast. So I'm going to read awesome. that. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to read that book. And I really do enjoy speaking with authors. Um, it, Cause I learned something and, you know, they enjoy talking about their book and I enjoy, you know, talking about it. So 
I'm going to try to do more of that. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe well, t- together we could maybe try to reach out to one of these people and, and do something like that. I might feel more confident if I had you there with me, maybe than you know, yeah, with myself. Yeah, that'd be good. I think Dr. Alan Berger would be a good person to reach out to. He's the one who wrote all those 12 smart things yep. to do when you quit drinking and all that, too. I know we talked about that quite a while ago, but... Yep, and I got yeah. those books, too. I got the yeah. books that, that he wrote. So that would be a, a good one to interview. Yeah. But I think that the science of addiction would be interesting. I'd also like to reach out to the... And this is so controversial, but I'd like to reach out to the um, Sinclair Method people mm-hmm. and have them come on and talk about the Sinclair Method. Um, I know that's totally, uh, controversial in AA. I, I, I oh don't, gosh, even with secular people. Oh, I know. And I kind of wish it wasn't that controversial because I mean, if it's, if it's just another means of helping people, um, mm-hmm. and it does seem to help a lot of people, then, then what's wrong with that? You know, I, 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 yeah. I, I don't know. And, and if it, if there's some science behind it that suggests that it works, then isn't that something we should be concerned with? We should be with. And, and, you know, anyway, the whole th- thing about the Sinclair method interests me, um, because, um, they're not trying to get me to treat to, to take the pill and drink or right. anything. You know, it's not really for me because I'm I'm already sober and everything, you know, but it does help people, you know. You know, it's really concerning. You know, there are people that are, you know, awaiting liver transplants and they can't stay sober. Right. You know, and maybe this would help them. I don't know. You know, there are people that there is they they are not going to go to AA and stop drinking. They're not gonna go to, you know. And, right. and this, if this helps them, I think it's a good thing to know about. So I'm kind of interested in getting them on too. Of course, any I kind do. of any kind of beef with harm reduction stuff just strikes me as a very religious type thing. You know, it's like the Catholic Church doesn't want to help in Africa with condoms because oh. it's almost like you know. Yeah. I mean, it's it's that same line of thinking. It's like, well, if I can stop drinking without any help besides AA, then everybody else should be able to too. It's you cult, know, it's cultish, and it's it like, is why. Wait a second. It's like, wait a second. Why does it have to just be only one way? And, and, and why do we have to be in camps? Like, oh, I'm in the AA camp and this is what I do. Why can't right. you maybe be in two camps? Why can't you do AA and SMART? Why can't yeah. you do AA and refuge recovery? You know, why do, why do we have to be in these camps? That, that, that just drives me crazy, too. So, yeah, I'm kind of, and that's another thing. I'm going to have Refuge Recovery. We're going to do a podcast with them. Oh, awesome. Mm-hmm. There's a guy that was going to our group, um, Dave, who, um, got into refuge recovery here in Kansas city. They have, they're starting off a group here and he really enjoys it. And, um, I'm really happy for him that he's got something that like that. And I'm really happy to see refuge recovery in Kansas city. I want to learn more about it. So we're going to have that, do that podcast. So yeah, I got some kind of things like that brewing. I want to do some more with you too, Ben, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, all that stuff sounds really interesting. It's, it's too bad that, uh, all of, AA seems to get stuck in the mud about all this stuff. Cause I mean, I can't imagine it was always that way because I really don't think Bill Wilson would have went out experimenting with LSD. If there was all this outspoken, don't do this, don't do yeah. that going on at that time. But there's nothing in any of the literature that says you can't, right. You know, be a member here and a member there and believe in this and believe in that. So yeah. it's, it's crazy. Yep. Well, I'm not going to let what people think or say bother me i'm just gonna you know we published an article on aa beyond belief about the sinclair method and that that is actually the most viewed article on our site Mm -hmm. well i'm sure it got a lot of reads from people who had nothing to do with the site too you know usually there's a lot of people before mm -hmm. and there's been some people that posted there recently who who have um talked about how the sinclair method has helped them too so Mm -hmm. yeah i'm kind of glad that we do stuff like that i'm very glad you do um and it's, it seems so ridiculous because, like you said, it's not like the Sinclair method. People are trying to talk to people who are 25 years sober right. saying, hey, you could drink and right. exterminate your addiction in your brain. It's right. like, no, right. you're doing fine. You don't need to do that. Right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway. So, yeah. So, anyway, I enjoyed this. Um, yeah. Too, really John. good podcast. We, t- we covered some great area here. Um, what movie do you want to do next? You know, I don't, you know, I kind of chose the last one, so maybe you could pick the next one. But, you know, I was thinking even subtle films like Sideways, I think, is a really good movie that has to do with a lot of drinking. Or, I mean, if you want to go back to When a Man Loves a Woman or anything, I'm I'm cool with whatever. I got a whole list of things that... Well, that we can, we can do. We can so. think about it. It's it's really a good way. It's a, it's a, it makes a great podcast because you know you talk about the movie a little bit, but you also, you know, we it, it kind of it tr- it brings uh, 
th- our own stories into into view. You know, we we mm-hmm. we it, it, it triggers. I hate to use that word, but it, it triggers a reaction in in us from our own lives. You know, yeah. so you know, I think it's good. Well, and for people listening to this that are on the Facebook groups too, please post something on this podcast about you know maybe movies you'd like to see or what the movie yeah. led you to think about. Just like we're talking about here. I mean, that's the whole point of this. I think. And something else we could try sometime, Ben, I've talked about this before, and I, we, you and I have talked about this before, is maybe we could try to do something live on YouTube. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. And and maybe get some people to interact, you know, that way, too. That could be kind of fun. So this yeah, is fun. Really this good. podcasting podcasting's fun. Yeah, <laughs> so. it is. Well, thanks All for right. letting me be a part of it, John. Oh, really thank you, Ben. It. it was so nice talking to you again. And yeah, talking to you. Let's not have it be so long next time. No, absolutely not. All right, you take care. All right, you too. Bro.